Hello YouTube, in this new episode of Legends of the Past, we are going to be talking about a man that is widely known in the fitness realm because he gave birth to the very famous trophy, the send out that we now give to top level bodybuilders on the pro stage. But not everyone knows the details of the life of Eugene Sando and therefore I have decided to give you guys an expose on all of the things I found, all of the details of the existence of the man that was nicknamed the perfect man. He was originally born Friedrich Müller in Russia and his parents eventually moved with him to Prussia in 1867, which was his date of birth. And not much is known from his very early childhood, but the one thing that we know for sure is that he was a very active child. He was the type to just roam around nature and to be always physically active. So it's no surprise that he would turn out to be the great man that he then became for physical development. But there was one moment in particular in the life of the young Friedrich that changed the trajectory of his existence forever. And that was a trip to Italy. He visited Roma or Rome with his parents. And this is where he discovered ancient statues, especially ancient Greek and Roman statues that were depicting the gods. So Zeus or even the demigods like Hercules. And he fell immediately in love. He couldn't believe the perfection of the human body that was represented in front of his very eyes. And at that moment, at that very young age, he decided that in the future, he wanted to look exactly like that. And this is how his passion for bodybuilding became. I find it interesting because to this day, it's still something that would make for a decent backstory of anyone who wants to get into the sport. It is still possible to look at those statues in 2022 and, and say, oh, I want to look exactly like that. So it also goes to show that the motivations that we have were also valid back then. And that's because the blueprints of bodybuilding have been within the ranks and the writings of humanity for a very long time. It's something that always motivated men to become better. And you will see that it's funny to witness the fact that he himself eventually became the very statue that he so desired to resemble because on his 18th birthday, he left Prussia uh, actually to avoid conscription because he didn't want to enter the war with France. And so he had to start working right away to support himself. And the only job available for him at the time that was aligned with what he wanted to do is being a model for artists. So he would pose and he would let artists use his body as a model. And he was exceptionally well demanded and requested when it came to sculptures. They wanted to actually look at his body to recreate the bodies of the ancient Greeks, of the ancient Romans. Which is interesting because this means that at a very young age, he had already pretty much accomplished his goal. He looked so much like the Greek statues that artists, modern artists of the times, believed that if they copied his body, they would come very close to represent the Greek perfection, the Greek ratio. So that was his job at the time. And we have an interesting anecdote, and it's something that might interest uh, the few of you that live in Europe. If you're near Be uh, Belgium, you actually have the possibility to go and witness the statues that were created after the image of Eugene Sendau. They are still uh, present in the Museum of Belgic Art. I don't know the exact name, but if you want to find the exact statue, I can give you the... Uh, the index and the name of the statue in French, which is Le Dénicheur d'Aigle de Joseph Lambeau. You can also look it up on the internet if you want. You type Joseph Lambeau and Eugene Sandow, and it should lead you to the statue. It's a statue of a man that resembles Sandow, who is sort of laying and trying to protect himself, and you see a great bird of prey attacking him. And the legend has it that apparently when they did the sculpture and he was posing, they actually had him pose with a bird as well and the bird clawed at his neck. That is part of the legend. We don't know if that's actually true, but I find that it's ex exceptionally cool if it actually happened. And you will see also that this sort of prefaces and prophesies 
the relationship that Sendao is going to have with animals, because animals of, of, of mythology and legends with symbolism attached to them make recurrent appearances during his life. So that was for his early existence and we could pretty much stop there. The guy was already so muscular at 18 that he was used as a model for statues, so his dream had come true. But he wanted more. He was a man of ambition and therefore his next step was to become a circus strongman. He wanted to make a name for himself and at the time being a model didn't pay much. So he entered the circuit. And the way it actually happened is that he met Louis Durlarcher, who was nicknamed Professor Attila, who took him under his wing because he saw great talent and sent out. And this is how his professional strongman career became. And that's actually at this very moment that, he's changed, that he changed his name, because before that, he was just known as Friedrich Mueller. And that is the moment where he adopted the name Sendau. And we are not exactly sure, but people surmise that the name Sendau comes from the maiden name of his own mother, which was Sendov, because technically, he was half Russian, and so that was the Russian part of the family that was named Sendov. He just transformed the V into a W, and that led to Eugene Sendow. It was his seed name as a strongman, and that's how the career of Sendow began. But it wasn't as easy as just becoming a strongman and making a million bucks. Even though he was talented, you had the ability or you had to develop the ability to attract a crowd, and the best way to do that was to convince people of your great strength so that they would then come to show, to see you at your show to witness that strength. And a way that Eugene found to do that for free and to get a free publicity run going was that he would go around Amsterdam and he would break machines that were put in place in coffees and in public places in general where people could test their strength. So, for example, for you, for us modern people, it would be the equivalent of these punching bags that you can find sometimes in arcades or even in restaurants or bars sometimes that measure your punching power. They had similar devices back then, but these were mostly focused on gripping strength, on pulling strength, etc. And Eugene actually found out that he was so strong, and since the devices were also made and designed after the common man, that he was able to break them meaning that he could just, just expend so much power that the, machi the machine would just break. And so he quickly realized that if he broke the machine in front of people, that would surely convince them to go, go see his show. So that's what he would do. He would go around Amsterdam, enter public places, break down machines, and just leave. And there wasn't really anything they could do about it, but after a while, it started getting annoying, and the police was actually put on the case. And the police was puzzled because they couldn't understand how the machines were being broken because it just looked like the machine was used for its proper utilization but was just pushed to its limits. No one took a baseball bat to the machine. It was just broken. And eventually, they actually ran into Sandow but actually managed to capture him. And when they first found him, they didn't believe that he was the one breaking the machines or they thought that he was using a device. So they immediately arrested him. And what Eugene did is that he told them that he had the ability with his bare hands to break the machines and he asked them to let him demonstrate. And so, because of course they didn't believe him one second, they allowed him to and he shattered a machine in front of their eyes and they couldn't believe it. And they were so impressed actually that not only did they let him go, but they also went to his show the very next night. So, this publicity stunt worked perfectly well. That is how Eugene got his start in the game of strongman, but it didn't stop there. The feats of strength were only getting started. The reason why the police didn't really believe that he had the power to break these machines is that Eugene wasn't your typical strongman. He wasn't 240 pounds, he wasn't a hawking mass of muscles, he was a relatively small man, and when he had clothes on, he was completely inconspicuous. Therefore, it was very often that he would walk into a strongman event and people didn't even think that he was going to compete. And he used that to his advantage. You see, if you watched the last episode I made of Legends of the Past, you have a decent understanding of the way strongman worked back then. 
you could walk into another strongman's event, another strongman's show, and challenge the guy. Some strongmen even made money out of that, asking people to come on stage, lift the weights, and if they could lift the same weights they did, they would go home with the money. Well, Eugene, utilizing his small stature, walked into the top strongman's show of the time, namely by a guy named Samson, and he walked on stage and just challenged him outright. And Samson just laughed in his face because he was so puny. There was no chance and no, no pot potential shot in hell. He was going to live that weight. And at this moment, because he had a flair and a taste for the dramatic and the theatrics, Sendo ripped his clothes. He actually had a suit custom made with very thin connections between each part that you could just rip like this. He would just rip his suit in front of the audience to reveal his strongman uh, uniform and attire underneath and his musculature. Because even though with a suit he looked like nothing, the second he stripped down, he looked massive. He had round shoulders, he had very sweepy triceps, big biceps, everything that at the time was considered to be almost superhuman. So it was said that the crowd always gasped at this, they were always amazed. And he, on that very day, just just gleefully picked up the same weight that Samson did, did it for more reps and easily, and Samson was just completely humiliated in front of his own crowd. He apparently threw a tantrum, which is interesting, and then left. And this is how Eugene stole the show. This is how he actually got the ball rolling, and that got him extremely popular at the start. And this entire shtick about coming up on stage with just a, a very heavy suit and then revealing his muscles was something that became, at some point, his trademark because he allowed the audience to make fun of him and to doubt him and then he would reveal his physique in its entire glory. And that was always something that just stole the show. He was very famous for doing this. So that's his introduction into the world of strongmen. Now, what type of feats of strength can we attribute to Eugene Sendow? Well, there are many. Keep in mind that also, of course, at the time, not many of them were documented, so some of them might be embellished, but you will see that with him, it doesn't really matter. What matters the most is his flair. He had a very good sense for what looked good, for what was going to be photogenic, and therefore, every single feat had something spectacular, something almost cinematic to it. For example, he would bridge. So he would get on his hands and on his feet and he would do a bridge with just his lower back holding his body and his limbs serving as feet, just like a table. And then they would put a plank in, uh, they would balance a plank on his body and the plank would run across his body horizontally and a horse would then climb onto the plank on one side all the way through his body. So the plank would of course shift because of gravity and then all the way across his body. And that was a feat that convinced people that he was strong enough to support a full horse on his belly, plus someone riding him. As the reason why I said that animals make frequent comebacks is because he used them for his shows. He understood the appeal of using just the human body to lift up something that is not supposed to be lifted. It's almost poetical because... If you think about it, we used animals to help us in the fields. The animal was, in a sense, a better version of a human for manual labor until the machines replaced the animals. And Sandow saw that, took that into, his, into account and integrated that to his show, where he was, he was actually demonstrating the fact that with man-made power, you could best the beast. Another thing he would do with horses is that he would get a pony, it was an actual, an actual horse, he told people it was a horse because it sold better. It was actually a pony. He would set the pony backstage, elevate it. He would go backstage and there was a harness around the pony. So he would grab onto the harness, lock his arm, and then he would, up, he would actually get the pony to rest on his back, lift it away from the device that was actually holding the pony in the air, and he would walk across the stage holding the pony like this, overhead. It wasn't technically overhead because the pony was resting on his upper back, so it was more of like a carry, uh, an assisted carry, but people didn't know that back then. The only thing they saw was a grown man carrying a pony with only one arm, and that was tremendous. People loved it. It was said to be one of his most famous stunts, so he would do it again, again, and again. 
He would also dress as a soldier because it was around the time where all of these great wars were happening. So war and the image of the soldier and the uniform was very present in people's minds and the common imagination. And then what he would do is he would have a bridge put on top of his back. So he would support a bridge on top of his back, which is something that strong men nowadays still do. And then he would have people either walk across or sit on the bridge. And th there's something symbolical in that. It's not just the strength. You see, the beauty of strongmen back then is that, yes, it was big men lifting big things, but there was, there was a subtext. There was always something going on beyond that. Nowadays, it's a little bit lost because we focus a lot of, on performance because it's now just pure performance of a competition. But back then, it was a way to, to share a message. And the message here was, his ability to uphold the wood on his shoulder, the ability of the soldier to save the empire per se. And people responded incredibly well to that type of imagery. They loved it. And this is when we start to see again a political side to Sandow where he truly was an artist. And I think it's the reason why he eventually branched out of strongman because even when he was a strongman, and don't get me wrong, he was incredibly strong, in his act, you could perceive the fact that he was trying to do more than that. He was trying to just transcend the art and the, the performance act altogether. So <clears throat> he eventually branched out into bodybuilding. He started as a strong man, but he went right back to his roots, understand and keep in mind that what motivated him at the start was the Greek and Roman statues. So it was physique. He did strongman because this was very popular at the time. There was an ability to make a name for yourself in that specific domain. But when he had made that name for himself, he went right back to his first love, which was bodybuilding. And actually, he's considered to be the first bodybuilder because he is the man that invented the name bodybuilding. That is him. And so the very first bodybuilding shows can also be attributed to Eugene Sandow. He started with just himself. And the way he would do it is actually very similar to today where he would put a box, he would step on the box to be elevated from the crowd and he would place himself underneath a light. He would use powders to underline certain muscles or he would actually make himself completely pale to look like a Greek statue and he would pose for people. And this was incredibly popular. Now, if we're going to look at the physique of Sandow, what are his stats? He was five feet eight and 185 pounds. So not short by any means, but not tall and not massive. He didn't have a, a, a hulking mass, but it didn't matter. What mattered was the flow of his physique. Even though he wasn't gigantic like the other strongman of the time, he had incredible balance to his physique. Even to this day, you take the physique of Eugene Sandow and you plug him into our wood, he would have a very good natural physique. The only things we could point out that are lagging are the chest and the legs, but that can mostly be attributed to the fact that they didn't really, not know, but they didn't really have the best methods to train them back then. Most horizontal presses were not invented yet. The dips and the, the bench press were not even there. They had the push-ups, of course, but it wasn't really enough. And you see that with Sandauer, he had a very, not meek, but sunken chest. There's not much mass there. And it's also true for his legs. Although I must say that his legs had a pretty good sweep. It's just that they were lacking in size. But if you are the type that wants the Greek proportions, they were pretty much the perfect size for his upper body, an upper body that was extremely, extremely jacked. He is actually the inventor of the six pack. He is the first person in history to show a well a crisp and defined six pack. That was his trademark. And that mesmerized people because it showed to them something that we all have. We all have a six pack. But that is just laying dormant in most humans. Sandow took it out. He showcased it to the wood. Likewise, he had big biceps. He had bicep veins. He had round shoulders. He had, he had shoulder veins. He had a good upper back. His upper back was also slightly underdeveloped, but it's also understandable. It's because, again, the methods that, that we use weren't really there. Now, when it comes to his strength methods, he did strongman lifts. So you can attribute some of his mass to that. He also had his own system of dumbbell training that I will detail in another video because I'm going to create a full nucleus overload circuit for you guys that is going to serve as like a template to integrate to your normal program. So we're not going to talk about that today. What we're going to be moving on is rather what he represented because I don't call him the perfect man for no reason. 
This is the nickname that he was eventually given by his peers and actually a name of a book that was written after him. But he himself didn't call himself that. His actual nickname at the time was Sandow the Lion Tamer. And there's an actual story, again, attached to an animal that comes with that. The anecdote was that back when he was doing a US tour, he wrestled, he wrestled a lion in front of an audience. The lion was actually named Commodore. And the story goes that when they were doing rehearsals, the lion was actually very aggressive and willing to engage him. But the second they did that in front of the crowd, the lion was cowering and he wasn't really willing to engage. So it made for a very terrible show. And the audience actually made fun of Sandow and even the journals of back then made fun of him. To which I respond, yeah, he actually stepped into a ring with a lion. And even though the, the lion was old and his paws were actually taped so as to not be able to rip him to shreds, that's still a fucking lion. I don't know many people would be willing to step into a ring with no protection, no sticks, no net, no nothing, with a lion to wrestle it, because it was the goal to wrestle the lion. And it, again, the legend says that Senda was actually chasing the lion and pulling on his tail to actually trigger him into attacking, but the lion didn't want to partake. So nothing actually happened. But that is the story of the lion tamer nickname that didn't stick because of course it was a dud. So what stuck afterwards was the perfect man. And why is that nickname more accurate? Well, it is more accurate because I think that it, it truly represents him. Keep in mind that we have footage of Sendow. We have actual videos of him, even though he lived at a time where photography and the ability to actually film someone was just at its infancy, to the point actually that he served as a model for Thomas Edison. For one of the first video captures of all times, it's a video of a bodybuilding of a bodybuilder flexing. It's a video of Sendo flexing his muscles. That video is still available. You can find it if you want. And Edison actually wanted him because he believed that because he was the perfect representation of the human body, it would make for the perfect specimen in front of a camera. He was seen worldwide as a symbol of robust manhood. He was seen as the pinnacle of what a man can look like if he actually puts in efforts, which again shows that he actually managed to fulfill his dream because that's what the Greek and Roman statues were. These were the representation of what men should look like. It was the ideal man. He was the perfect man. He was exactly in line with that. And he utilized that image to actually start his bodybuilding shows. He would flex in front of audiences around the world and remind them of what men are capable of. It's the reason why people were so entranced by it is because they were watching a guy that was reminding them of their, dorm, of their dormant potential, of what was lying inside them. And I find that uh, it's actually what characterizes him the most because this is what started the craze around bodybuilding at the time. I know it's, it's crazy to think, but there was actually hype around natural bodybuilding in the Victorian era, which is not surprising because there was a focus on the body that was starting to, in a sense, push away the Puritan values that Sendow actually participated in, meaning that he himself brought forth the posing in trunks and the posing in very light attires to showcase as much musculature as possible. He even brought that with women, which if you think about it, is fairly scandalous because at the time, women were not super encouraged to show skin. But because he revamped the entire thing, he convinced people that this wasn't indecent. This was just art. A bodybuilder flexing is not someone who's just, again, exposing himself indecently. What they're doing is they're showcasing the beauty of the human body. And people were incredibly receptive to that type of message. So we can thank him for that. It is because of Eugene Sendow that now this timidity around the human form has been replaced and we have the ability to showcase what we have built to inspire others. Of course, it was always done for him with a goal in mind. The goal was never to push deviancy or to again push some nasty behaviors. It was always virtuous. And he himself, as I said, would flex in front of people. 
And he had a message attached to it that personally touched me greatly because it's something that I try to do as well. You see, he didn't just flex in front of people and then tell them that he was a god on earth and no one could actually do that and he was special, which many people do nowadays. What he did instead is that he would repeat to people endlessly that anyone could become like him with enough discipline and exercise. And it's why he was so liked. It's because it, he didn't just show people what they could be. He also told them. He told them and he assured them that it was in the card for them. And it's because he didn't want physical fitness to become an elite club that only those with good genes could enter. Isn't that crazy? 120 years ago, this guy perfectly prophesied what would happen to fitness. He perceived that there would come a time where people would blame their incapability of achieving good physiques on their genetics. He, in a sense, he predicted the black pill and he was trying to white pill people before it was even a thing by reassuring them and telling them that it was entirely possible for them. Sadly, his message didn't stick. Nowadays, you have people who speak part the bullshit of built different and if you don't have perfect genes might as well just give up. I wish that we could just bring Sendow back to life and he could slap them around or just grab them like the pony and just walk them for like 15 minutes until they just finally just tap out and say okay I'll stop being a bitch Mr. Sendow I'll, I'll start doing push-ups and chin-ups. If we have the technology one day we start with Eugene. So that was his big tour that was his big appeal. And it was to the point that his status, again, as the perfect man, the perfect representation of what we all should look like, went to such a level that a sergeant, no, not a surgeon, sorry, a sergeant, because it was the last name of the guy, Dudley Sergeant, a teacher at Harvard, stated that, that and I quote, Eugene Sando was the finest specimen of manhood he had ever seen. Is there a greater compliment than that? You meet someone and they're like, yeah, you're like, you're perfect. This is what a man should look like. This was him back then. And this could have been anyone else. And it still could be everyone else if and only if you put in the work. But it's interesting because this was also accompanied with a certain level of vanity on his part, which I personally don't disagree with. If you look tremendous, why wouldn't you be a little bit vain? He was actually known to tell people that it was great to look at yourself. It was great to feel good about yourself because it would boost your confidence, it would make you feel better, and you would become a better person to be around. He actually insisted in his publications that people train in front of mirrors and they flex and they appreciate their own flex because he called it a mirror mood boost. It would elevate your mood, it would make you see your results, and it would make you want to do it again. So, in a sense, Eugene Sandow was the first pump appreciator. He was the first physique enthusiast. He was the guy that you have in the gym that comes around and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, nice biceps, bro, and you have a smoke on your face for the rest of the day. He was that type of uplifting presence. And it was incredibly necessary because people back then didn't know shit about physical fitness. So it was needed that someone would give them the confidence to start training. He was an empowerer, even though this, this doesn't exist, I made it up. But that's, that's the best way to describe Eugene Sandow. He would empower people. And then he didn't stop at men. He wasn't the type to just say, oh, men should train and the rest fuck off. No, he actually is one of the first persons in recorded history to encourage people, women included, to train, to lift weights, not just train, not do aerobics or fucking Tai Chi in the park like an old lady. No, no lift weights. He was, in a sense, an early feminist, or at least a feminist in the truest sense of the term, meaning that he wanted women to be the best version of themselves. And so he encouraged them to train relentlessly. And I have a quote that I want to share with you because it is incredibly based. <clears throat> the influence of exercise on the bodily frame of women is still indifferently recognized. The prevalent idea is that muscular exercise of any active kind makes a boy of her. The idea is a delusion, and its evil results are seen in the absence of grace, beauty, and shapeliness of physical contour, which we associate with a perfectly formed and finely conditioned woman. And to that I say, amen. Lifting is not just reserved. For men, if you lift and you're a woman, you won't look like a dude. You will look, surprise, surprise, 
like a woman. You will have nicer curves. Your body will develop the way it's supposed to. A woman who lifts becomes more feminine. A man who lifts becomes more masculine. There is no way around that. The only exception is if you introduce hormones in the mix, then yes, a woman who trains while taking male hormones will look like a man. But for my natty sisters on this channel, and I know there's 2% of you, there is no problem associated with lifting weights. Lift to your heart content. The person, in my opinion, that looks the more feminine is the woman who trains because you're going to develop the muscles and therefore the fat deposits in areas that make the most sense for your, gener uh, your biological sex. So you look tremendous. You'll look like a statue because if there are Greek and Roman statues that depict the perfect male form, there are also statues that depict the perfect female form. And you will see that these are not skinny chicks, they're not overweight, there are women who have the shape that they should have, which is the feminine curves. Now, of course, if you are a woman and you lift weights, you might get even more than that. You'll have bigger legs, a bigger ass, a, a, a more finely shaped upper back, more defined arms, etc., etc. But all of that still aligns with an image of femininity. So we can also thank Eugene Sendow for that. He was an appreciator of both the male and the female body, which might also come down to the fact that he was apparently bisexual which would also explain the moustache. Now, uh, when it comes to his achievements and the institutions that he left behind, because he wasn't just a showman, he was also a businessman, he opened the Institute of Physical Culture in 1897, where he would open gyms around the world and he would push physical development onto people. And that way, he actually brought attention back to the human body and its marvels by pioneering bodybuilding shows, like I already described. But the funny thing about these bodybuilding shows is that, one, the way they were ran was, it was usually 30 men that were wearing, like, fucking leopard skirts and all sorts of badass shit in front of a jury, and the jury would actually go up on stage and observe them from up close. Like, they would look at every detail of their body. It was that serious. And some of the judges included celebrities like Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a very close friend to Eugene Sandow. And actually, they became friends because Arthur started training after the recommendation of Eugene, and he actually cited his training for the reason why he survived what should have been a fatal, fatal car crash. He got into a crash, he got out of it uh, intact in one piece, and he was like, Jesus Christ, all of these neck curls, all of these fucking yoke movements saved my life. It protected me from a fatal concussion. So he felt like a, he was indebt, indebted to send out in a sense. And he wasn't the only person that was actually inspired by Sendow. I can also cite you Theodore Roosevelt, because yes, Sendow did tours in the US to promote health and fitness. And so he met the president. And the president was also an avid physical culturist. Doesn't that make you sort of jealous? To, to know that the Americans of back then had a president that lifted, wouldn't you want a president that lifts? And I don't mean like plays golf and does a few aerobics here and there. I mean someone who lifts, someone who shows up with, to like the UN with bulging biceps. Wouldn't that be the dream? Can you imagine having a president with a thick neck? Someone who can climb up a, 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 a flight of stairs and not be out of breath? Someone with massive quads that just ripple through their, their pantsuits? One day, one day we shall achieve that, my brothers. But back then, they had Roosevelt, who was, I think, nicknamed the Moose, and who actually tanked a bullet to the chest. His chest was so thick that he could tank a bullet. So that was all of the connections of Eugene Sandow. It was truly the power of universality. He was a, and even though I hate that term, but he was a true citizen of the world, meaning that he had the ability to connect with every single culture through his physique. He didn't even have to speak. It reminds me of the scene in uh, Full Metal Alchemist for my anime enthusiasts on the channel, where you have uh, the you have Armstrong and you have the Butcher, and they don't even talk to each other. They just take off their shirts and they flex, and that's all they need. That's the language of strongmen. Well, that was exactly the language that Eugene Sandow spoke. He would just showcase his physique, and that was it. People immediately understood his message. And so he was loved in every single country. Because beauty is a universal language. We all have the same level of appreciation for a kick-ass physique, regardless of where we come from, regardless of our races, ethnicities, etc. It doesn't fucking matter. It's the reason why I believe that fitness 
could be the thing that just manages to get us all together because it is it just crosses every single frontier every single border every single just ethnic line nothing resists fitness nothing resists the iron we can all be brothers in iron and that is something that Eugene Sandow had understood back then he had understood that we're all designed to appreciate the human body and therefore it was his life mission to push that as much as possible and as a reward, in 1911, he got appointed professor of physical culture to King George V. So he literally served the king. He was so well known at the time that he served as physical, in a sense, personal trainer in a, even to a king. And it's funny because we could also say that Eugene Sender was the first personal trainer. I found snippets and things that he would put into his magazines because he had publications back then for physical fitness, of course where he would, in a sense, sell himself to the public and he would tell them, hey, if you pay me $10, I'll make you a personal training plan. He went from that all the way to being the personal trainer of the king. It's like if you started in a fucking shitty, like, 24-hour gym center, like LA Fitness or something, and 20 years later, you are the personal physical fitness, not just physical fitness, like, employee, but... You are the professor of physical culture to the president of the United States. That's that type of grind that we're talking about. So it was truly an accomplishment that is worth noting. He had managed to align the body and the spirit. He had made bodybuilding into an art. Sadly, nowadays, most of that is, is lost. If you look at what bodybuilding has become, when you look up at those bodybuilders, you can't really relate. You can't tell yourself, I will look like this unless you're really stupid because they are not in the cell realm that we are anymore. They don't really speak to the, the human and the male inside us anymore. He still had retained that capacity, and that's the reason why also he inspired people to train. I think that pro bodybuilding nowadays fails to do that. It doesn't inspire people to train, and it inspires people to just look up at them like gods. But if you look at the type of audience that consumes bodybuilding now, it's just DLs, it's people with pencil necks, it's not people who actually train. Nowadays, he inspired men, and it's something that I wish we could actually bring back. But we are working on that with the other natties on this platform. So, that was, again, his crown achievement. We can also cite the fact that he named, he wrote the famous book, Life is Movement, his best work, in my opinion, in an effort to prepare humanity for the difficulties of warfare. So, yeah, he was, he was that real, meaning that he put physical development to the service of countries so as to better prepare not only civilians, but also soldiers, because he trained the Brits. He was hired, again, by the UK to train British soldiers, which... If you look at his origins, a Prussian training the Brits, it's a little bit of a betrayal. At the time, no one seemed to care. He was that much of a chad. He was that much of a, spe of a specimen of male that people were like, yeah, if anyone else did that, we would just hang them for treason. But it's Eugene Sendow, so I guess he gets a pass. That's amazing. And on the list of achievements, we can also cite the fact that he is also credited for transforming yoga. So apparently he traveled to India. He was amazed by yoga. And they were amazed by what he made it into, meaning that he turned it into actual physical activity. I don't want to spout bullshit and speak out of my ass, but from what I understand, yoga was very spiritual and based on meditation, and he brought a more, again, exercise-based uh, routine to the entire mix, which gave birth to the yoga that we know nowadays. This guy did literally everything, and yet he's not as well-known as he should be. And this used to be even worse because now his name is back on the scene and we know who he is thanks to the Olympia, etc. But back then, after his death, he was completely unknown. And that is because a series of unlucky events and occurrences just started piling up on one another. For example, the fact that World War II left him almost bankrupt because his publications and products were all manufactured in Germany. So it all got shut down. And in terms of product, I can cite you the Sendo Dumbbell. It was a dumbbell mixed with a gripper. So it was a dumbbell that you had to squeeze. It's interesting as a concept, right? It's a little bit gimmicky too, but it's something that he actually used to sell. But he had to stop because the production shut down. And then afterwards, he also was involved in some shady dealings. Apparently, he was unfaithful to his wife. And so when he actually died at the age of 58... His family just completely cut ties with him. They apparently burned all of his possessions 
they buried him in an unmarked grave and his name almost disappeared. It's, it's a great grandson of Sandow that actually managed to dig up his name and restore his glory. We can thank that guy for that because we could have just lost all of the information I just shared with you. It could have just disappeared into the abyss of memory. And the way he died is actually quite sad. He died at the age of 58, as I said, of an aneurysm. And just days prior to this fatal aneurysm, he got into a car accident. So we don't know if that led to this. I don't fucking think so, because when he got the car accident, he himself lifted the car out of the ditch in which he ran into. You and I, we call like uh, la dépanneuse Europe Assistance so that we can get our asses out of the ditch. He was just like, ah, all right, get into the ditch, grab the car, get it out and go home. That's it. And then he died two days afterwards, but he died of Chad. We can at least, give, at least give him that. And he was 58. 58 grabbed the car and carried it outside of a ditch. That is insane. Of course, a lot of his stories were exaggerated. So we don't really know what is real and what is not real. But at the end of the day, it's why he became a legend. It's why his legacy is still relevant to this day. And mythology or not, his physique was real. And it's what I just said at the start. Eugene Sandow accomplished what he set out to do. He wanted to resemble the Greek statues. He did, it, he did that and more. He didn't just look like them. He served the exact same purpose. Greek statues were built and sculpted to inspire the Greeks and remind them of their potential and the absolute paroxysm of the human form they could achieve if they put in the work. Sandow did the same thing. This video proves that. Just telling about this guy what makes you want to get it done. It motivates you. His physique was a shining beacon of the human potential. And that is why he was the perfect man. Not because he was above all, not because he had perfect genetics, but because he was the perfect proof that there is such a thing as accident and that it's achievable to everything. And for that, I believe that we all owe him a ton for his physique that inspired us, but most importantly, for his story and for all of the things that he went through so as to be able to give us that hope, give us that light, and give us the possibility to realize our own potential because we see it in him. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.